Hello and welcome to this e-lecture on reproductive ethics. My name is Owen Schaefer. I'm an assistant professor at the Center for Biomedical Ethics. And today I'll be walking us through this, uh, some highlight areas of this complex uh, and socially fraught area. Okay, so today I'll be covering some very basic core concepts in reproductive ethics um, that are applied to a number of different domains. We'll look at a case study uh, on potentially compelling a uh, cesarean section in a case of a distressed pregnancy. Then we'll turn into an area of substantial um, social and ethical dis uh, deliberation and disagreement, abortion, and think about both the law and the ethical aspects uh, of abortion in Singapore. And finally, um, we'll spend some time on an overview of ethical issues in assisted reproduction, a number of specific uh, points where there's been a number of deliberations and uh, some regulations in Singapore. Okay, so to start off in reproductive ethics, one core question in the clinical context is to think about who is the patient. Right? When one is treating, when a, a doctor or um, a healthcare provider is treating uh, a pregnant woman, who, who is the patient uh, at, 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 in play here? There's two possible individualistic answers. Um, one is to say, well, only the pregnant woman uh, is the patient. Another um, alternative is to say both the pregnant woman and the fetus are both patients together. So uh, the first option is to identify a single patient. The second option is to identify two patients that are being treated at the same time. Uh, but there's problems with both of these individualistic approaches. Okay, so the problem with the first approach, uh, treating only the pregnant woman as a patient, ignores one of the main functions of obstetrics and gynecology uh, and related treatments, is that, well, it's not just about treating the mother, um, it's also to ensure um, healthy outcomes for the fetus and for the resultant child. Uh, indeed, to focus only on the patient's well-being, uh, on the mother's, sorry, the well-being, ignores the impact of treatment on the future well-being of that child. And indeed, um, that sort of focus only on the mother might be contrary to the values and expectations of the pregnant woman who's seeking care, who's not only looking after her own well-being potentially, but also uh, ensuring the health and well-being of her child. So then maybe we should treat this as there being two patients, the pregnant woman and, and the fetus. Um, but one of the challenges with uh, this two-patient model um, is it treats these uh, two individual, individuals um, as separable, as two distinct um, people, even though they're actually, uh, their interests are deeply intertwined. Right? Um, the interests of the fetus and the, and the mother cannot be really be easily separated in these, uh, in these contexts in a way that one might do for two different patients. Indeed, it obscures the unique relationship, the gestational relationship that occurs in pregnancy, and also sets up a potential challenge of a dilemma, of a trade-off between the interests of two different patients that might lead uh, to challenges in order to determine how to proceed in cases where the interests of the two might conflict. An alternative proposal um, that some in the literature have put forward is to, instead of taking the individualistic model, is to recognize interlinked interests. So even if we consider the fetus to be a patient, which might, might be helpful in certain contexts, uh, that we recognize these interests are interlinked and that you cannot fully separate the interests of the mother and the fetus. This dependency between, uh, of the fetus on the mother um, th does give rise to certain maternal rights and responsibilities. And that in turn uh, gives rise to a general understanding of the primary responsibility for weighing up fetal interest, for determining those trade-offs, for assessing those, um, those factors, falls to the pregnant woman herself. Right? So that the decision-making authority is vested in the mother. And this has particular implications uh, for informed consent. So on this intertwined model, decisions concerning treatment um, and, and, under, and prevention during pregnancy are going to fall entirely to a pregnant woman who has mental capacity. Now, of course, there will be familial involvement in these decisions. Don't need to obscure that. Um, and in, 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 in many cases, the father will be involved uh, in care decisions and care pathways. And this may well be um, consonant with the values and priorities of the pregnant woman. Um, but that, of course, will still be dependent and determined, determined by the extent of the familial involvement will be at the discretion, uh, generally speaking, of the pregnant mother. Now, of course, as with many areas of, uh, of informed consent, there are various caveats that apply. Uh, of course, uh, disclosure of all material um, risks and benefits, including to the pregnant woman and the fetus, are going to need to be disclosed as part of the informed consent process. Um, and this is, again, assuming the patient uh, does have capacity. We'll return to the capacity question in a little bit with our case study. Uh, but also, just as a reminder, uh, the uh, responsibility to ensure informed consent is obtained does not mean that uh, patients have a right to demand any treatment 
that they request. Um, un unindicated treatment that does not, does not provide benefit to the mother or the fetus uh, do not need to be offered merely at request.